everybody. Welcome back to the Brittany Hughes Show. So the one unfortunate thing about doing this podcast only once a week, at least for starters, and on doing it on uh, Thursdays, is sometimes things happen either at the end of last week or at the beginning of the current week, and I don't get to actually talk about it until Thursday. So that's one of my one frustrations with how we do this, uh, at least moving forward. Um, but of course, I'm talking about last week's SCOTUS decision handed down on Friday that overturned Roe versus Wade, sent abortion issues back to the states. And the reason why it's been so frustrating waiting this long to address this and to talk about this is I have had to spend the last nearly a week watching the left just rampantly lie about this issue. And it's been incredibly frustrating because I have seen how in my own life, whether it's family members or friends of mine, how they have bought into these lies. Some are just asking questions. Is this really true? Is this not true? Can you clarify this? Others seem to have gone whole hog into the fear mongering that the left has been stirring up over the past week. Um, and buying into some of the outright falsehoods that aren't just a little bit deceptive. It's not like it just skews the issue a little bit. We're talking about straight up just baseless lies that have been told about abortion, about medical care, about the effect that this ruling would have on women, about the pro-life community. Um, and the, the fact checkers seem to be nowhere to be found. All of the fact checkers that were all over the place during COVID and, you know, making sure that there was no medical misinformation, making sure that only the facts got out there, that there weren't any lies being told. Those people seem to be absolutely nowhere to be found. I have come across so many blatant pro-abortion lies in the last week that have just been left to just percolate on Facebook or on Twitter or on YouTube. Is this a surprise? No. Is it incredibly damaging to people who might buy into this narrative? Absolutely. It is absolutely damaging. It is, it, it's absolutely vile, essentially, is what this is. And so I've been waiting to do this all week long. I want to go through some of the biggest lies that the left and the media have been peddling about abortion and about the pro-life stance and about the future of this country post-Roe. And so if you have heard some of these, if you have maybe bought into some of these narratives, if you're out there and you're worried about what the ruling actually means for women, if you are seeing some claims and you're not sure if they're true or if something has come across and now you find yourself scared, this is for you. If you're a pro-lifer that's not quite sure about how to respond to some of these issues, that maybe feels like you're tripped up when you come across one, this is also for you and some information and some data that you can actually fall back on on, and we're not going to go any with anything but the facts here, which seems to be the opposite of the way that the left is going. And so I want to start with that. I want to start with talking about why the left is lying in the first place, because I think this is a really key point. The only reason to lie is when the truth can't back you up because it's not on your side. If you thought you were actually correct on an issue, if you thought that morally and ethically and scientifically you were correct, you wouldn't need to spin anything. You could fall back on the truth by itself, and that would be enough. There's an old adage that the truth is like a lion. If you let it out of its cage, it will defend itself. And so if you were a pro-abortion advocate, and you actually believed that abortion was something that women should be able to choose and that that was morally and ethically and scientifically based. You wouldn't need to spin a narrative based on these falsehoods. But that's not what we see with the left. There is only one argument in favor of abortion that is both scientifically sound and intellectually honest. And that is acknowledging that this is a human life with its own unique set of DNA markers from day one, and that it is a, a, a preborn child. It's of this, the, the Homo sapiens species. So we're talking about a unique human life form, and that abortion terminates the life of that child, and that that is okay. That is the only scientifically based, intellectually honest argument in favor of abortion. 
And believe it or not, some leftists are actually embracing that. It sounds absolutely horrific. Yes, it's scientifically based. Yes, it's intellectually honest. But morally and ethically, it's absolutely vile. And most people know that. But believe it or not, there are some on the left that are actually embracing that. And I can at least respect the fact that these people have acknowledged that this is a human life. So to say that it's not is not scientifically accurate. And they accept that. They acknowledge that. And that abortion kills that human life. The nation, which is a liberal rag, actually had this to say following the SCOTUS ruling. Abortion involves killing. And that's okay. So what we see here in this article, the author lays out an argument that people are killed all the time, whether people are killed in accidents or whether people are killed because, uh, you know, somebody invades somebody else's home and is shot dead. People are killed in self-defense, whatever. And that that is the same thing as an abortion. Abortion does end a life and that that is acceptable because the fetus's life does not matter when compared to the mother's. That's the argument that's being made. Again, First of all, that that um, it, it accepts a false premise right off the bat when you're talking about murder in self-defense. Comparing a human child that was only conceived via the choices of other adults is not the same thing as a burglar who of their own autonomy and volition goes into someone's home in an attempt to victimize them. We're talking about a human life that was conceived because of willful choices that someone else made. The baby didn't ask to be here. The baby didn't create itself. The baby is not the same as a robber that intentionally breaks somebody's window, crawls into their living room, tries to make off with their checkbook, and gets shot in the head for their trouble. That's not the same thing. But at least it is intellectually honest to say we acknowledge that this is a human life, we acknowledge that abortion is killing them, and that is okay. However, you don't see that argument being utilized by a lot of leftists. You don't see that argument, by and large, being pushed by the networks on the airwaves. And you don't see that argument being utilized by pro-abortion politicians like your Nancy Pelosi's or your Chuck Schumer's or your Joe Biden's. It's not going to go well in the court of public opinion to sit there and say, look, we understand that this is a baby. We understand that this is a life. We're not trying to argue that this isn't life, that this isn't a child, that this is not not its own unique human organism. We're just saying that you can off it and that's perfectly acceptable. That's not going to be received well by the public. That's not going to be received well if you tried to codify that into a law. So they're not going to do that. Instead, because science isn't on their side, what they do is they lie. They lie and they lie and they lie some more. They peddle falsehoods and they spin up narratives and they push fear mongering on women in an attempt to paint this picture that women are going to be dying in droves and that this is taking away reproductive health care, which is a term that is a complete misnomer and implies something positive that is helping women live. And they try to spin that and to direct your attention away from the fact that this is killing a child and towards the idea of rights, that this is restricting someone's rights, that this is restricting bodily autonomy. And they peddle outright lies in order to do it and in order to instill fear in women. And so we're going to go through some of the top lies that they have been telling this past week and why every single one of them is completely false. Lie number one. First of all, that the SCOTUS ruling last Friday outlaws abortion in the United States. Now, this is one, believe it or not, that I have actually seen peddled on social media repeatedly. And again, the fact checkers nowhere to be found, even though this is 100% totally false. And you don't see the media pushing back on this narrative and trying to clarify what the ruling really does. Because again, they are more than happy to let the idea lie and to, 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 to let the notion stand that from New York to LA, rights are being restricted and women are now in danger. And that the United States is going back to some third world, you know, bastion of, of poverty and despair or some nonsense. So first of all, let's talk about what the, school, the SCOTUS ruling actually did. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because it's extremely basic. The ruling kicked abortion restrictions back to the states. 
That's all it did. It didn't ban abortion. Trust me, I want a nationwide ban on abortion. Abortion is a stain across this country. It's a stain across every single state that allows it. If there were a national ban on abortion, I would be all for that. Because I believe that unborn children are people in their own right and are already protected by the 14th Amendment in the United States Constitution. I think that the basis for that is already there. So if that's what this ruling did, I would be the first one to scream it from the rafters. That is not what the ruling did. All it did is it sends restrictions, it sends abortion laws back to the states so that the people can decide for themselves, for their locality, for their state, what they want to allow where they lived. And that what's interesting here is that if as many people supported abortion as the left wants you to believe, this wouldn't be a problem for them at all. Because every state would have enough people in it that want abortion that they would just pass laws codifying abortion. This flies in the face of their narrative that America loves abortion, is all for the right to abort your child up through the ninth month if you want to because it's your choice. The fact that there are states that are restricting abortions goes against the public sentiment idea that they want to create. The vast majority of Americans do not believe that abortion should be allowed without restriction beyond the first trimester. Most Americans want some or all restrictions on abortion in general. So again, if the vast majority of people loved abortion, it shouldn't be any problem that it's kicked back to the states because every state would just pass a law codifying abortion. That's not what's happening. But what is happening is you're seeing a divide between states based on the ideology of the people there. Nine states have already banned all or most abortions in their state. Other more blue states, like your New Yorks and your Californias and those kinds of places, they are seeking to codify abortion all the way up through the ninth month, and in some places, even putting very scary language in their laws that might allow the murder of innocent uh, born children in what they call the perinatal period, which is the days or weeks after birth. So you see the radical difference between some states. That's what this SCOTUS ruling did. So if you hear somebody saying that abortion is now banned in the United States and that we're, you know, like, like, you know, some sort of a country that's run by the Taliban where women don't have rights, that's not true on a host of levels. But the idea that it's been banned across the United States is just simply factually untrue. Another lie that you're going to hear the left tell repeatedly over and over and over again is that women will die in droves without access to legal abortion. This argument has been around for eons. And over the past week, you have seen it ginned up over and over and over again. You will notice that when leftists make this argument, they very rarely use numbers to back it up. They don't point to a whole lot of data because the data doesn't support this claim. Leanna Wen, the former Planned Parenthood president, once claimed that thousands of women died from back alley abortions before Roe. Thousands of women. Amazingly enough, the Washington Post fact check her and said this was not true. Estimates are fuzzy and vary dramatically for the number of deaths from abortion in the 1930s. But they all hover in the thousands. That number declined dramatically after the advent of antibiotics. It continued to drop in the years before Roe, as some states loosened abortion restrictions. But that includes deaths from legal and illegal procedures. By 1972, fewer than 100 women died from abortion. 39 of those were illegal. Presumably, women did die in the thousands from illegal abortion in the 1930s. But when ignores the substantial drop in mortality after the advent of antibiotics, Less than 100 deaths would be more accurate. She earns four Pinocchios. When you've lost the Washington Post, when even the Washington Post, as pro-abortion and as far left as they are, comes out and says, eh, you know what, that's actually not factually accurate, you know you've lost. It is not true that thousands of women died from back alley abortions before Roe. The year before Roe was handed down in 1973, 35 women died from botched illegal abortions. 35. Now, I want to be explicitly crystal clear here. 
I am not saying or insinuating in any way, shape, or form that those 35 women who died was not a horrible tragedy or that their lives did not matter. They were entirely invaluable. They were human beings with self-worth and dignity, and they deserved better than buying into the lie that the world would be better off without their child, that abortion was the acceptable answer, and that they could not bring their baby into the world. They deserved better. They were victims in and of themselves. Regardless of their circumstances, regardless of their reasons, they deserved better. And it is a travesty that they lost their lives. They were human beings created in the image of God, just like their children. And they should never have died because they bought into this lie. But that is not the same thing as thousands of women. Those two numbers are worlds apart. The left wants to paint this picture, this apocalyptic narrative, that all across this country, every single back alley, in every single city and every single town is going to have some woman behind a dumpster bleeding out, lying next to a coat hanger because she couldn't get the reproductive health care that she needed. And that is simply not true. It didn't happen before Roe, and it hasn't happened in the states that have already handed down pretty strong abortion restrictions like heartbeat laws or 15-week minimums, or maximums rather. It, 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 it's not happening now, and it wasn't happening then. Not in nearly the numbers that they want to, to, to paint in your mind. But they want to instill the fear that all across this country, women are going to be victimized, and women aren't going to be able to get the help that they need. And it, it, it paints this idea of women now being relegated to second-class citizens because they cannot get safe terminations of their own children. And that's simply not true. If that were true, you would have seen a lot more of this happening before Roe. But this is what the left does. They want women to be scared. They want people to be outraged, which is why they push things like lie number three. Now, personally, I think this is one of the most heinous ones that exists. I think this lie is particularly vile and offensive and disgusting, and it's not at all fact-based whatsoever, but it's one of the most pervasive lies that the abortion-loving left has pushed over the past few days. In a tweet posted this week, actress Halle Berry retweeted a graphic that reads this. The treatment for ectopic pregnancy is abortion. The treatment for a septic uterus is abortion. The treatment for miscarriage that your body won't release is abortion. If you can't get those abortions, you die. You die. That tweet has gotten over 360,000 likes and counting. It doesn't matter that it's not true. It doesn't matter that it's absolutely ridiculous. It doesn't matter that it devalues women and their children that were lost to ectopic pregnancy or to miscarriage. It doesn't matter that it conflates two completely different situations and that it's not at all fact-based when you look at the laws that are being passed. Hundreds of thousands of people on this one website alone have bought into that, and I guarantee you countless more across this country are buying into the narrative that women are not going to be, be able to to get not only reproductive health care and abortions, but basic medical care to save their own lives. And that is simply not true. Ectopic pregnancies and miscarriages are not abortions. The medical care for women in life-threatening emergency situations is not an elective abortion. An elective abortion is when the single goal of the procedure is to terminate the child so that the woman will no longer be pregnant, and that's it. When the sole purpose of the abortion is because she no longer wants to carry that baby. That is not the same thing as a medical procedure that is being done because there is some other factor that is necessitating that procedure. Her life is in danger. 
something has gone tragically wrong with her pregnancy and with that child. That's not the same thing. There is a difference between an elective abortion whose sole purpose is to terminate the child and a medical procedure which is is intended to save a woman's life and that by necessity and as a result, the tri- the child tragically dies. Those are not the same thing. An ectopic pregnancy, and I have family members who have experienced this, and it is tragic. And these women who desperately want their babies should not be used as a pawn in the left sick game of trying to make elective abortion okay. An ectopic pregnancy is when a fertilized egg doesn't implant in the wall of a uterus like it's supposed to and instead implants somewhere else, such as the fallopian tube, where as it grows, it and the mother would both die because it cannot be sustained there. It cannot be nurtured there. It's literally growing in the wrong place. There is no other procedure as of right now that can treat an ectopic pregnancy. But treating an ectopic pregnancy to save the woman's life, to keep her fallopian tube from rupturing, that by its very nature necessitates the removal of the baby, is not an elective abortion. And the women who have to have this done are often devastated because they desperately want that child. And it is insulting to say that they're having an elective abortion to save their life. That's not the same thing. Miscarriages. Miscarriages and elective abortions are not the same thing. Miscarriage care, when you have a miscarriage but your body does not expel the baby that has died of natural causes on its own, that's called a silent miscarriage where you don't even know sometimes that it's happened until you go in to see the doctor and they can't find a heartbeat or have some other way of realizing that something has gone tragically wrong and that that child is now deceased. The the procedure for extracting fetal tissue in that scenario is not an elective abortion. Again, because the intention is not to end the life of the child and make the woman not pregnant anymore. That's already happened. A septic uterus, same thing. Other medical conditions where, again, unfortunately the treatment kills the child, but that's not the point of the treatment. It's a byproduct of the treatment. It's a result of the treatment. Saying that women will not be able to get medical care for ectopic pregnancies or miscarriages is like saying that banning elective chest surgeries on transgender children, wherein you mutilate the perfectly healthy body of a teenage girl, would then keep women who are diagnosed with breast cancer from getting medically necessary mastectomies. Nobody would make that equivalency. It's not the same thing. Saying that you can't mutilate the chest of a teenage girl does not have any bearing whatsoever on whether or not someone who has been diagnosed with breast cancer could get a medically necessary surgery to remove one or both breasts. It's not the same thing. Nobody would ever say that that's the same thing. So to say that the treatment for a silent miscarriage or an ectopic pregnancy is the same as a woman marching into an abortion clinic saying, I made a mistake, I don't want to be pregnant anymore, is not only factually incorrect, but insulting to the women who have tragically found themselves in that situation, who are now being lumped in with people who just simply decided they didn't want to have a baby. Not to mention, legally speaking, it's not correct. There is no law in this country, no state law, that bans medical care for women facing these situations, that bans miscarriage care, that criminalizes miscarriage, that's going to throw a woman in jail for having a miscarriage. Not a single one. Not to mention, and here's something that nobody wants to talk about on the left. The left likes to paint this narrative that the only people on the right, the only people who are anti-abortion are dudes, It's just a bunch of men, right? Of course, that completely uh, omits the fact that Roe v. Wade in 1973 was handed down by a court of all nine white men uh, and this incredibly diverse court, including a woman, uh, actually overruled it this past week. So we're just going to completely ignore that. They also like to paint the picture that women are not pro-life. 
They like to ignore us. And it's not just that it doesn't fit their narrative that they've got a monopoly on women. It's also because they wouldn't be able to make ridiculous claims like the right wants to ban ectopic and miscarriage pregnancy care. Because why would Republican women, why would pro-life women, why would conservative women, why would the female legislatures who are in many cases drafting and introducing these bills and voting to support them, why would they want to ban care that many of them have received themselves? If you look at the pro-life movement at the forefront of it, whether it's the activism, whether it's the lawmakers that are supporting it, if you look at those who are most often introducing these bills in state legislatures, many times what you see is that it is a woman. Many of these women have had miscarriages, them, miscarriages themselves. Many of these women have had ectopic pregnancies or another medical situation that necessitated certain care. Many of these women have tragically lost children that they wanted. Why would they ban the very care that saved their lives? They wouldn't. There is literally no reason for the pro-life right to want to attack medical care for ectopic pregnancies and miscarriages. None whatsoever. It would be shooting ourselves in the foot. But of course, the left doesn't want to acknowledge that these women exist. The left doesn't want to acknowledge that there are, in fact, many people on the right and on the pro-life side that understand how pregnancy works and understand how ectopic pregnancies and miscarriages work and have no interest whatsoever in attacking those issues. Because, of course, that doesn't fit their narrative. Instead, they want to paint the right and the pro-life community as a whole bunch of guys who don't understand basic biology. Hilarious, given that they're the side that actually thinks that men can become women and vice versa. Another lie that the left likes to push, and this is one of my very favorite ones um, because we live this out every single day that they are outright lying, and that's the idea that pro-lifers are only pro-birth. They do not care about the baby or their family after the baby is born. There are plenty of responses to this one. And so most obvious one that many of us uh, on the right have been saying for years and living out and proving every single day uh, is that we are actually the side that wants to support women through pregnancy and after birth. Pregnancy centers which outnumber Planned Parenthoods across this country and which are supported almost if not exclusively by donor dollars, they aren't propped up by government funding, Pregnancy centers are doing this work every single day. They are providing at no cost medical care for pregnant women, whereas Planned Parenthood, by the way, they charge. Whether they charge the woman or they charge her insurance company or they charge the government or whatever, they're getting reimbursed for the cost of those medical procedures. Pregnancy centers, that cost is borne almost exclusively, if not exclusively, by donations, and they do not charge women. Not only that, but after the child is born, these are clinics that are offering uh, counseling and um, counseling on pregnancy and childbirth, counseling on healthy relationships and parenting. These are centers that are providing women and mothers with free baby formula and clothing and baby items and help getting to and from doctor's appointments that are walking alongside women after they have their baby, and some of which do so for years as long as the woman continues to have that relationship as long as she chooses. And they do this every single day. I don't see Planned Parenthood walking alongside women who choose to carry their babies. I don't see Planned Parenthood offering baby formula, especially in the middle of a nationwide shortage, to women who might need it. I don't see Planned Parenthood running little baby boutiques with free clothing and baby items for women who can't get it. I'm, I'm not seeing this from the pro-abortion left. They will help you terminate a pregnancy, but they won't help you carry one. And it happens every single day in pregnancy clinics. So the idea that pro-lifers are only pro-birth is provably wrong. And if the media would spend half a second covering pregnancy centers the way that they cover abortion clinics, you would see this. But these are not spotlit. These clinics are not talked about, by and large, unless they're being demonized as so-called fake clinics that are trying to prey on women and take away their choice. Now, as far as 
the policy standpoint goes, and this is why the left likes to dismiss that, right? When you bring up pregnancy centers and these are places that are helping women and walking alongside them and, and, and all of that, they like to dismiss that and say, yeah, well, you don't support paid maternity leave, paid paternity leave, welfare, universal basic income, uh, free childcare for everybody, free food for everybody, free Lamborghinis for everybody, whatever. That's immediately where they jump to, right? Yeah, you might support your local pregnancy center and they might help a woman get free baby formula, but you don't support anything that would actually help make the structure of her life better. So this is something I want to talk about because I think that a lot of times on the right, we are put on the defensive and we feel like we don't have an accurate answer to that. I'm going to give you the accurate answer to that. First of all, as far as policies go, if somebody, uh, if, a, if a government um, or a governmental structure is going to make a policy regarding things like paid maternity leave or welfare or any of kind of the social safety net, structural things, child care, that kind of thing, if a state or if a, if a government is going to make a policy that addresses these issues, it should be at a state or better at a local level. The most macro it should ever get is on a state level. And there's one reason and one reason alone for that. That is because localities and states are much better equipped to deal with policy solutions to help the people that actually live there. When the federal government comes in and tries to do it, whether it's on health care or taxes or um, minimum wage, anything that the federal government tries to do, education, at, at, a, at, a, at a high 37,000 foot level, the federal government screws it up every single time. Because the people who live in rural West Virginia and the people who live in urban LA shockingly need different things. Localities need different things. The people that are there need different things. And so I think if you're going to have a policy response to how to better help women who choose to carry or women that have babies now that they can't get abortions in their states, if you're going to have a policy answer and policy solutions to try to support them, it needs to be at a local or federal or a state level so that it can actually address the needs of the community and the actual women who are living there. But beyond that, and I'm just going to go ahead and put this out there because I think this is one of the best answers to this liberal gobbledygook that you can't be pro-life if you don't support X, Y, and Z policy. And that is this. Supporting a person's right to life does not necessitate that I have to then financially support their life from here till kingdom come. It doesn't mean that I don't care about their life, that I'm devaluing their life. I believe in their right to life. I believe in the right to life for every single preborn or born child in this country. I believe that my next door neighbor has the right to life. I believe that my next door neighbor has the right to live in his home free of a threat of somebody busting in his door and shooting him in the head. He has that right. But it does not then follow that just because I believe he has a right to life, I have to pay his mortgage and his medical bills and pay off his car. I don't have to agree to financially support somebody and to solve all of their problems just because I believe that they have the right to not be murdered. But that's the basis that the left wants to create. You can't be pro-life if you don't, don't then follow it up with support of all of these policies that we want to create that give everybody free stuff. And this is where I think um, it, it's, it's incredibly difficult sometimes because on the right and as pro-life, we do want to see women succeed. We do want to see babies supported. And so I think sometimes we find ourselves at a loss of how to respond when somebody says, well, what are they going to do about childcare? What are they going to do about maternity leave? What are they going to do if they're poor? And this is where I think it's incredibly, it's incredibly important to also bring into the discussion when you get to abortion you've already accepted a premise of problems. By the time you're even discussing whether or not a woman should be allowed to abort her child, the reproduction here has already happened. 
the problems have already started. So I think the response here is not, oh, well, we need to uh, establish all of these safety nets and we need to make sure that we support all this stuff that the left is now making a qualifier to be pro-life and the pro-life position here. Um, how about we start talking about some personal responsibility before we even get to the point where we're talking about how to support a child? This is the answer here. It's not about creating a welfare or a safety net to catch the problem. It's about addressing the root cause of the issue in the first place. Because here's the problem with going down the road of all of these welfare policies or all of these governmental solutions and all of this money that now is going to have to go to propping women up and making sure that their families are supported. It will never, ever stop if you start going down that road. If you let the left control that narrative, you will never find an end to it. There will always be some other policy that they think is going to solve the issue. There will always be some other government takeover that they want to see happen. There will always be more money that's needed or something else to spend it on. And it will never, ever stop. And you will find yourself chasing an ever-ending list of things that you now have to support in order to qualify as being pro-life. If you adopt two children, well, why didn't you adopt three? If you support paid maternity leave, well, why don't you support universal basic income? It's going to keep going and going and going because the left never runs out of government policies or other people's money, ever. So don't even, don't even go there. Don't even go there and start chasing that train of all of these policies that they want you to support. What you do need to do, by the way, though, is go find your local pregnancy center and make sure that you're supporting them in whatever capacity you want or whatever capacity you can so that they can start meeting these needs. But the idea that beyond that, we are now financially on the hook for absolutely everything that mothers or their children might need is not only preposterous, but um, is, is basically just a straw man argument. Which brings us to number five. Since we don't support the idea that the government has to then pay for everything, and since we don't want children to be murdered for convenience, well, now the left has to go into this lie. That's banning abortion equals forced pregnancy and birth. Because now you're forcing someone to be pregnant and to give birth to a child that they can't afford or that they don't want or whatever. And that banning abortion is forced pregnancy and birth. And the reason that they use that language, again, is to try to create this idea that the right and pro-lifers are actively seeking to oppress women. That's where you get the whole handmade tale nonsense. AOC tweeted this this week, that forced pregnancy is a crime against humanity. Never mind that murder, especially infanticide, is a crime against humanity. Forced pregnancy is a crime against humanity. Let's deal with this real quick. Forced pregnancy, forced pregnancy is when you rape someone until they become pregnant. That's forced pregnancy. And it's already illegal. It's already heinous, and everybody across the board, including pro-lifers, agree with that. Forced pregnancy is when you rape somebody repeatedly until they become pregnant, and then that was your intention. That's forced pregnancy. There's no such thing as forced birth. Forced birth literally doesn't exist. Because if you are pregnant, you are going to give birth. There's no way to avoid that. Once you are already pregnant, I don't care whether it's at the very beginning of your pregnancy or all the way past nine months and you're two weeks overdue. You are going to give birth. The only two things that have left to be decided are at what point you're going to give birth and how developed the child is at that point. That's it. You're going to give birth. If you miscarry, if you have an abortion, regardless, of, regardless of, 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 of your circumstances or what you choose or at what point in your pregnancy you're going to give birth, something inside has to come out. If you have a medical abortion, a medication abortion, at seven weeks that forces your body to miscarry, you are in effect giving birth. So the idea of for, for forced birth isn't even a thing. Um, but they like, to, they like to create that because, again, that sounds oppressive. That sounds like it's victimizing somebody. 
Let me be explicitly clear, and this goes back to my earlier point, let me be explicitly clear, because you see this time and time again, that pro-lifers want women to have babies that they can't afford and want to force them to carry and birth their children. No, we don't. We don't. If you are already pregnant, I want you to know that you are inherently valuable with worth and dignity, and so is your child. Your child is inherently valuable just like you. If you are already pregnant, I want you to know that you can be a good mother. You can carry this child to term. And you can either raise them or put them up for adoption for a loving family who will happily and with joy take them. That's what I want you to know. But if you are not yet pregnant, I want you to understand that pregnancy is a natural consequence of sex. We need to start talking about this before we get to the point of questioning whether abortion is okay. No pro-lifer on this planet wants women to have children that they cannot afford before they are ready. We want women and men, because women do not get pregnant on their own, we want our society in general to make responsible sex decisions, to make responsible decisions about intimacy and when they choose to have it and with whom, so that before this even becomes a question, that foundation has already been established. Once reproduction has already happened, that ship has sailed. And we want to deal with the root cause beforehand. I have no interest in a bunch of scared teenage girls with no jobs having babies left, right, and sideways. I have no interest in a girl struggling to make ends meet or struggling to get through classes or having to give up a scholarship because she finds herself pregnant before she's ready. I have no interest in children being brought into this world, uh, you know, in, in, in terrible family situations or in extreme poverty or uh, with fathers who are completely absent. I don't want this in any way, shape, or form. I want responsible decisions to be made before this. And whether or not you say this is realistic, because that's the natural uh, response, right? When you start talking about don't have sex until you are ready to at least accept the possibility that it could result in a child, people say, well, that's not realistic. Human beings are animals. Human beings have sex, which is completely and totally demeaning to human beings and completely devalues our inherent worth as being created in the image of God, but is also, um, it seems to to argue that this is not a realistic thing to expect. To that, I give you this article from Business Insider published just this week, and it states this. Swearing off men and avoiding intimacy, Gen Z reconsiders sex in the wake of a post-Row world. So in this article, Business Insider tells the story of of several young ladies, including one whose name is Adeline. I'm going to read this to you. Adeline has always tried to make responsible decisions regarding sex, she told Insider. Her mother was a teen mom, and Adeline grew up watching the ways in which that impacted both their lives. She always told herself that she would wait until she was 17 to start exploring intimacy. A whole 17. When she reached that age earlier this year, she said she went with her mom and had an open discussion about sex where she talked about getting on birth control. But ever since the draft decision was leaked, Adeline says she's had to entirely rethink whether or not she wants to start having sex, telling Insider that she is terrified to make a choice that could leave her with an unwanted child. Good. We're supposed to believe that this is a bad thing. We're supposed to look at Adeline and say, oh my gosh, this 17-year-old girl can't just go have one-night stands with people, and that is tragic. How is this a bad thing? How is it a bad thing that this 17-year-old girl is now having to rethink whether or not she's going to have sex with men whom with, to whom she is not married and with whom she does not want to have children, and that that is somehow a bad thing? How is it a bad thing that this young lady being forced 
to take some responsibility for herself. And to not get pregnant in the first place, that's supposed to be something that we find to be tragic. That's not tragic. That's how it's supposed to be. You're not supposed to be having sex with people with whom you do not want to have children. You're not supposed to be having sex with people to whom you are not committed. Pregnancy and childbearing and having children is a natural consequence of having sex. The point of sex is reproduction. It's not the only point, but it is what happens when you have sex. If you are not ready to at least accept the possibility that that could happen, then you shouldn't be having it. And I am not going to lament that a 17-year-old girl is having to accept that fact and can't just go out there and act like an animal in a gutter with every guy that's willing to do that who is just as culpable in this situation, by the way, that is not going to make me lose an ounce of sleep that we are telling kids that it might not be possible for them to abort their child if they do choose to make irresponsible decisions and find themselves in that situation. The fact that we are supposed to find this to be a travesty that teenagers can't run around experiencing hookup culture really says a lot about where we're at as a society. And it says a lot about where the left is at, that it has to tell every single one of these lies, that it has to sow seeds of fear and terror, that it has to paint women as an oppressed class, that it has to completely ignore the fact that this is a human being that is being murdered in every single one of these abortions. The fact that the left has to lie to get their point, the fact that the left has to lie to get their way tells you everything you need to know about what they believe. It is based in lies. Don't believe them. And that's it for the Brittany Hughes Show. Make sure that you do check out full episodes of the show on YouTube, Rumble, Instagram, Facebook. Also, make sure you go over to YouTube, or um, I'm sorry, to iTunes, uh, and hit subscribe to the Brittany Hughes Show. That way you don't ever miss an episode. I will see you back here next Thursday. Have a fantastic and safe 4th of July.